welcome back myself pushpendra singh and uh, we are going to start with our daily current affairs so as you know that uh, these lectures are basically uh, meant for those who are preparing for the civil services examination which is conducted by the upsc all right and we are basically referring the two nation newspapers the hindu and indian express for this purpose and you can supplement your preparation with the help of these lectures so let's begin with the lecture okay so first news is all about the innovation for the defense excellence right so which is a scheme which is launched by the ministry of defense okay so here the new scheme which is been approved or which is been launched by the defense ministry here the rajnath singh who is also the union defense minister have has approved the budgetary allocation for the innovation for the defense excellence okay here 498 crore rupees have been allocated for the purpose of the innovation for the defense excellence right this is the scheme which is been launched right you know uh, for the next 5 years right by the government of india okay now here the most important aspect is that the idx or the innovation for the defense excellence that we are talking about is basically you know uh, some sort of a funding mechanism for basically for the startups okay as well as some sort of a you know the startups which are meant for the defense production okay this idx or innovation for the defense excellence itself is basically managed by the defense innovation organization okay it has been funded by this organization or defense innovation organization which is a not not for profit not for profit company which have been set up under the company set 2013 okay now this defense innovation organization was basically set up by the two founder members that is the defense public sector undertakings or defense psus the first is hindustan aeronautics limited and the second is bharat electronics limited so both hindustan aeronautics limited as well as the bharat electronics limited are basically two, two important founder founder members of this defense innovation organization which is basically currently funding the innovation for the defense excellence under the ministry of defense okay now here as you know that the budgetary allocation of 498 crore rupees have been set up have been basically a mark for the purpose of this innovation for the defense excellence now what will this 498 crore rupees would be there under innovation for the defense excellence so here it will provide the financial support right financial support to almost 300 startups right these startups are basically you know uh, for the purpose of you know uh, the defense preparedness for the purpose of defense production as well as the individual innovators right so here the startups will be uh, eligible for the purpose of funding then innovators the individual innovators will also be will also be eligible then msmes that is micro small and medium enterprises would also be eligible by the defense innovation organization for the funding under the innovation for the defense excellence right now what is the purpose of this innovation for the defense excellence it's aimed at basically creating some sort of a ecosystem to foster the innovation and technological development in the defense right uh, because it is uh, approved by the ministry of defense so definitely is something which is related to the defense as well as the aerospace you know uh, applications so by engaging how would you engage how would you engage that is including you know Uh, your micro small and medium industry your startups by uh, by the innovators by research and development institutions right by the academia so here the most important aspect is you need to create a ecosystem right for the innovation for the technological development for the military purpose for the defense purpose for the aerospace purpose right by engaging all stakeholders that is msme startups individual innovators research and development institutions even academic institutions also right so here the scheme is basically aiming to provide some sort of a grants right or the funding to carry out such type of research and development work right specifically to those uh, you know startups which are having good potential for the indian defense and aerospace needs so definitely it will also support you know some sort of awareness you know in the indian innovation system about the defense needs and definitely it will also you know boost the infrastructure development with the ministry of defense so here the idx or that we are talking about you know uh, the innovation for the defense excellence would function as a executive arm of basically your defense innovation organization so definitely the defense Inno Inno innovation organization would definitely fund right it will also provide some sort of a high level policy guidelines to the idx or the you know uh, your innovation for the defense excellence so here the innovation for the defense excellence framework establishment 
right, is most important idea of the defense innovation organization, which is basically for the purpose of the promotion and indigenization of aerospace and the defense sector in our country, specifically at the startup level. So here, as I told you, nearly 300 startups will be eligible for the funding. Other than startups, the micro, small and the medium enterprises, individual innovators and the partner incubators will also be eligible under this. You know, uh, you are basically the innovation for the defense excellence, right, under the Ministry of Defense that will be funded and managed by the Defense Innovation Organization, which is itself a non-for-profit company. Okay. Next, you have basically the exports of the agricultural products. So agricultural products basically include some sort of items or some sort of, a, you know, uh, the commodities which belongs to the agriculture. So here we are concerning about the agriculture and the allied sector. So here the Ministry of Commerce and the Industry recently stated in a report that there, is, there was a tremendous growth in the agricultural export from the country in the last financial year. So that means despite of having the COVID-19 restrictions, uh, despite of having a lot of problems, lockdowns in our country, the agriculture export have continued to spur specifically from the country in the last financial year. So here, the Ministry of Commerce and the Industry gave the data, data that the, the exports from the agriculture and the allied products, right, that also include the marine and the plantation product basically have registered around 41.25 billion US dollars, you know, uh, the export specifically from the agriculture and allied products that has been, you know, registered a growth or increasing the growth of around 17.34 percentage during the fiscal year of 2020-21. Okay, as you compare with the last fiscal year that is 2019 and 20. So from the last last year 2019 and 20, this year an increase of 17.34 percentage of the export specifically uh, from the agriculture and allied sectors have been registered. So combinedly, right, from the agriculture and allied sector, the export basically jumped to 41.25 billion US dollars, right. Specifically, the agricultural products, right, uh, the, the products which have witnessed a huge export or huge growth in the exports that are inclusive of the cereals like the non-basmati rice, which is also the most important aspect because until now you have the basmati rice ex export, but now the non-basmati rice also been exported. Apart from the non-basmati rice, the wheat, millets, maize and other agricultural products were also exported. Okay, the most important export destination for the agriculture and allied products are basically 58, 58 countries around the world, right? The largest market basically existed in the USA, followed by China, Bangladesh, United Arab Emirates, Vietnam, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, Nepal, Iran, and Malaysia. Okay, highest growth in the export have been report have been recorded uh, for the Indonesia, Bangladesh, and Nepal. Okay, next you have the Pyros. Tria Lalji. The Pyrostria Lalji is basically a new species of tree. It's basically a new species, right, of a tree, which have been recently been discovered or recently been discovered from the Andaman Islands. The Andaman and Nicobar Islands are basically union territory belongs to the, you know, uh, from the Republic of India. So here, the 15 meter tall tree that is basically belongs to the genus of a coffee family, right? Generally, this genus of the coffee family is basically reported in the Madagascar, which is a basically an island nation in the Indian Ocean. But now, the Andaman Islands in, in the country is also reported this 15 meter tall tree, right, belongs to the Pyrostria or the coffee family genus. It's also been discovered from the Andaman Islands, right. So, here the first such species was basically reported from the South Andaman from the Bandu forest, okay. The other places in the Andaman and Nicobar Island, from there, this genus of the coffee family or the Pyrostria algae was discovered was the Tirur forest, which is lying near the Jarwa, Jarwa Razor forest, right, as well as the Chidia Tapu forest, which is also in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, okay. Now, if you just consider the global distribution of this, you know, your Pyrostria, the algae or the specific genus of the tree species of the coffee, this new species is also the first recorded in India, right? And now this genus is basically was usually found in the Madagascar. The Madagascar is an island country specifically in the Indian Ocean region. The most important distinguishing feature, right, if you see the morphology of the tree, 
right it is basically having the long stem this stem basically having the whitish coating so it is just like a, you know uh, a shiny coating is there on the trunk right and the leaves are basically the oblong oblate right with the cunate base so what is this oblate leaves see oblate leaves are basically you know uh, is a x shaped is a x shaped leaves right with with basically a some sort of a base so here base we are talking about the cunate base the cunate means a wedge shaped leaf right which is having some sort of a acute angle at, at the base so roughly you can say that it is narrowly triangular at the base but it is having the acute angle towards the base so it is x shaped of specific leaves which is having some sort of an acute angle at the base of the leaves other important physical features which distinguish this this type of species are basically from the other trees species is basically some sort of an umbellate inflorescence right which is having around 8 to 12 flowers now what is this inflorescence see inflorescence means a group or a cluster of the flowers right you just see a cluster of the flowers or the group of the flowers okay just like this right uh, which is arranged on the stem right some stem will be there and it is basically composed of the main branch of you know uh, you know some sort of a uh, you know different different branches that will be basically offshoot from the stem so here in the botany or uh, which is a subject in the science so in the botany the embell that we are talking or the embellate in the in the influence what we call is basically consisting of the number of short flower stalks so here you will have this short flower stalks okay uh, which is also called the pedicles in the botany which is basically spread from the common point so you will have this common point right uh, it will looks like almost just like a umbrella ribs so just like you have the umbrella where from the common points the you know the ribs will be you know uh, you know all around this you know uh, towards the periphery so just like that the embell in the influence sense basically consisting of the number of short flower stalks which is basically spreading from this common point just like a umbrella ribs okay in regarding the international union for the conservation of the nature it has been regarded as the critically endangered species that means it has been right in the highest level of the protection which has been granted right because it is already the critically endangered now this uh, species that we are talking about the pyrostria lalji it has been named after the lalji singh the lalji singh was basically the joint director and the head of the office of the andaman and nicobar regional center right with the botanical survey of india okay just like this i was talking about this inflorescence right which is just like group or the cluster of the flowers which is arranged on the stem just like this is a stem the group of the flowers so just like one two three four five a group of the flowers basically arranged so what we call is basically is embell right embell in the botany or embell in inflorescence right which is basically consisting of you know the number of short flower stalks so you have short flower stalks okay and uh, which basically spread from this common point so you will have this common point right which will have at least 8 to 10 flowers 8 to 10 or 8 to 12 flowers so you could count it 1 2 3 4 5 6 like that you will have 8 to 10 flowers from the common point okay next you will have the project oxygen for the india the most important context for this project is basically the you know the manufacturing or the medical oxygen shortage in our country as you have seen that the second wave of covid or second wave of you know the covid 19 pandemic was basically somehow over right we have lot of casualties during the second wave of corona okay and we have we have also faced lot of you know uh, in fact the severe shortage of the medical oxygen specifically for those people who are uh, you know uh, who are basically affected because of this covid 19 pandemic now here the office of the principal scientific advisor basically launched this project oxygen for the country okay the main purpose of this project oxygen for the country is to enable various stakeholders right who would work to augment the medical oxygen supply or to to meet the rise of the demand of the medical oxygen in the country okay now here the project oxygen for india is basically a step up right uh, to the production of this medical oxygen to meet the potential increase in the demand right due to the further waves of you know any sort of a pandemic you may have the third wave of pandemic also right 
we can anticipate right so it's an initiative of the office of the principal scientific advisor okay to uh, to develop this manufacturing medical oxygen right which is also become very very important during this pandemic okay now let us understand about uh, about basically about this project so here you will have the national consortium of oxygen this national consortium okay of oxygen basically consisting of the various stakeholders now this project oxygen for the india that will help or that will enable the supply of critical raw materials right which is basically used for the purpose of medical oxygen like you have the zeolite right that will be used for the setting up of the small oxygen plants as well as you know uh, you know uh, the manufacturing the compressors the final products like just like your oxygen plants concentrators ventilators right so here the consortium is also working right uh, under this project oxygen for the india to strengthen the manufacturing ecosystem for the long term preparedness for containing such type of the pandemic or such type of waves that require the medical oxygen for the purpose of the treatment of the patients so here let us understand about the office of the principal scientific advisor to the government of india this office was first created in the november 1999 right Uh, it was first created and this cabinet secretary secretary basically established the office of the principal scientific advisor to the government of india now here what we are talking about uh, you know uh, the office of the principal scientific advisor basically what is the purpose of this office of the principal scientific advisor it he is basically the chief advisor to the government of india the, on the matters which is related to the scientific policy right so you could understand that uh, it is a chief advisor or he is a chief advisor that could provide some sort of a objective advice to the prime minister as well as the cabinet on the matters which is related to some sort of a scientific you know uh, the criteria for example to the science technology innovation right with uh, some sort of a critical infrastructure economic and the social sectors right it will basically provide some sort of a objective advice to that matter and the first you know uh, the principal scientific advisor that we are talking was basically the great uh, the scientist dr a p j abdul kalam right he was the first uh, you know uh, the pr the principal scientific advisor now he was considered the first principal scientific advisor because at that time in 1919 in 1999 you know you have atal bihari bajpayee atal bihari bajpayee who was basically the prime minister at that point of the time the prime minister atal bihari bajpayee basically government at that point of the time created this cabinet rank position which is also known as the principal scientific advisor so under atal bihari bajpayee government the ipj abdul kalam was basically our first principal scientific advisor to the government of india okay and also uh, the principal scientific advisor also heading the nine member prime ministers the science technology and innovation advisory council that is also known as pm stiac that is prime minister science technology and innovation advisory council so what is that see it is a overarching council that facilitate the principal scientific advisors office to access you know some sort of a status in the specific science and technology domains right it will also help the principal scientific advisor to comprehend the challenges in the hand right to uh, to formulate some sort of a specific interventions to develop some sort of a future futuristic road map and to advise the prime minister as well as the cabinet right accordingly as per the mandate okay so here the project oxygen which is being also been uh, you know uh, you know uh, started by the principal of or the office of the principal scientific advisor okay next the integrated food security phase classification so here what we are talking about this integrated food security phase classification right which is basically uh, a tool right to to analyze and to and to have the decision making right planning specifically with respect to the food security in the world so here what we are talking about the this tigray region in the ethiopia right the ethiopia is basically a country in the africa so this tigray region in the ethiopia is basically a restive region restive region means there is lot of problems right for example here the special forces of the tigray regional government are basically fighting with the ethiopian national defense forces so lot of peoples lot of casualties are already there right just like a civil war type of situation is basically going on in the tigray region because here the special forces 
right? Uh, which is basically, you know, fighting with the Ethiopian National Defense Forces itself, right? With the country's forces itself. So here, the UN Emergency Relief, Relief Coordinator, Mark Lockwock, right? Lockwock basically recently says that this Tigray region in the Ethiopia is witnessing, right? The famine, the famine-like conditions, right? Here, the integrated food security phase classification classified this Tigray region in the phase five of this classification. In the phase five of this classification. So, what is this phase five of this classification? Here, almost three lakh fifty thousand people, right? You know, are experiencing the famine-like conditions. So, in the phase five of this integrated food security phase classification. Here the criteria is at least 20% of the household, right? Basically facing the complete lack of food, complete lack of food, right? They don't have the basic needs, right? They are just starving to the death, right? So they are facing the deaths and the destitution, right? And they also have some sort of acute malnutrition that is prevalent for around, you know, more than 30% of the total households in that in the Tigray region. And the mortality rate is also very very high. So this is the phase five, right? As per the integrated food security phase classification. So recently the UN Emergency Relief Coordinator basically, you know, classified this Tigray region the phase five of integrated food security phase classification. That means this region is facing the famine. The three lakh fifty thousand people is basically, you know, as experiencing the famine. So here the integrated food security phase classification is just simply a tool right which can with the help of this tool you can analyze the food security you know uh, the scenario in the particular region in the particular region so here that we are talking about the integrated food security phase classification you can say it's a it's, a, it's a innovative multi-partner initiative for improving the food security and the nutrition analysis as well as it will also help in the decision making okay so by using this ipc classification right uh, the government, the UN agencies, the various NGOs, the civil societies, other relevant actors, right? They can determine the severity and the magnitude of this, uh, you know, acute and chronic food security or insecurity, as well as it will also help in the determination of the acute malnutrition situation in the country. So the main goal of this IPC or Integrated Food Security Based Classification is to provide the decision makers with some sort of a rigorous or the evidence and consensus based analysis right uh, with respect to the food security and uh, as well as you know the, the acute malnutrition so that it they could uh, they could respond right uh, with some sort of a uh, you know the policy measures or with some sort of a programs right so here this ipc was originally developed by the fao by the fao or food and agricultural organization right here this ipc or integrated food security phase that we are talking was developed in 2004 by developing 2004 okay now this ipc classification basically standardized the scale that integrates the food security nutrition and the livelihood information related to the particular area so this basically the ipc classification distinguishes you know the links uh, you know that that basically differentiate between the the food insecurity the chronic food insecurity the acute malnutrition definitely to support you know the societies in the in the better manner so this ipc was originally developed for the for the purpose of uses in the somalia by the by the united nations food and agriculture organization which is basically the united nations agency right here the most important aspect is that this ipc scale basically having the five graded scale okay so you can by summarize you can see here in the phase one that is the generally food secure you know the status that means if any region is the phase one that means this region is the food secure that means almost 80 percent of the household can meet their basic food needs without having any sort of a coping strategy by naturally they can meet their basic food needs if any region of any country is basically in the phase two that is just borderline of the food insecurity that means they can they can basically uh, become a food insecure right if not intervene that is the borderline food insecure so here the criteria is at least 20 percent of the households right uh, you know they have the food consumption they have reduced right but that is minimally adequate just minimally adequate right they can they can uh, they can they can become a food insecure over the period of the time if not intervene right and the phase three basically is 
those countries or are those countries which are having the acute food and the livelihood crisis the criteria is very very simple at least 20% of the households have significant food consumption gaps right and here the level of acute malnutrition is also very very high right also above the normal so what is this acute malnutrition see the acute malnutrition would be understood in terms of the nutritional deficiency the nutritional deficiency right this nutritional deficiency is basically resulting from either inadequate energy or the protein intake in the population so specifically the children's or the women you know they are having you know primary acute this malnutrition that is specifically very very common in the underdeveloped countries or in the developing countries that is because of the social factors economic factors environmental factors right it is also because of inadequate food supply in the phase 4 the countries which is facing some sort of a humanitarian emergency the criteria is at least 20% of this household face extreme food consumption gaps right and that is also very very high the acute levels of malnutrition as well as the excess mortality rate will also be very high in the phase 5 which we are talking about the tigray region in the ethiopia which is currently facing the famine right at least 20% of the households basically face complete lack of food or the basic needs right they are just starving to that they are just basically at the position of death and destitution where the acute malnutrition basically prevails around more than 30% of the household in the tigray region right where the mortality is the mortality rate is exceeded right two persons per 10000 persons per day so here the mortality rate will be calculated like that so it is mortality rate is exceeded two persons per 10000 per day okay so here the classification or ipc classification that we are talking about in the phase 1 generally food secure in the phase 2 moderately or the borderline food insecure in the phase 3 acute food and livelihood crisis in the phase 4 the humanitarian emergency in the phase 5 you have the humanitarian catastrophe or simple famine okay next the open societies statement so here right the g7 the g7 is basically nothing but you know uh, the intergovernment intergovernmental political forum which is basically consisting of the seven democracies or seven you know the developed countries seven developed countries right which are generally all democracies now what we are talking about this open society statement so here recently the g7 summit was basically held and as a part of g7 g7 summit okay the 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 permanent member of g7 as well as the india right signed this open society statement that was basically adopted at the end of g7 outreach session so in the in the g7 outreach session right the prime minister narendra modi was invited as a lead speaker as a lead speaker so at the end of this outreach session right which is basically also titled as the building back together that is the open societies and the economies right that was the title for this open society statement or that was the title for this you know for this outreach session right here the prime minister narendra modi was basically a lead speaker this open society statement is something which we are talking about right uh, right the freedom of expression right the values which is given in our constitution right the freedom of expression uh, in the open society statement is not only inclusive of the offline but also the online that means you have the freedom of expression through the internet right the freedom of expression through the public profiles the freedom of expression through the internets here the many democracies right here the many countries around the world you know are basically shutting down their internets right whenever there is uh, the public you know outcry against the government you know atrocities so that is something this open society statement is basically a progressive statement to to uh, to outline you know uh, you know uh, in the strict sense that the democracies and the governments around the world have the responsibility of not you know uh, scuttle down the voice of the people or the societies specifically during you know the movement specifically during such violent movement so during during such movements the shutting down of the internet basically is a threat to the freedom and the democracies around the world so here the joint statement was basically signed by the g7 countries that is g7 countries as i told you is basically intergovernmental political forum that g7 countries basically consisting of the canada okay france 
then Germany, then Italy, okay, then Japan, then UK and US. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, you have seven countries or seven progressive nations. Along with that, India, South Korea, Australia, and the South Africa was basically invited, right, to uh, to the outreach session, right? Here, the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson called these seven countries plus four countries the india south korea australia and japan seven plus four seven plus four so you will have 11 so all these 11 countries the british prime minister basically called the democracies 11 that is the new term that has been involved in this outreach session of g7 right which is basically adopted at the end of this g7 outreach session okay the most important uh, aspect of this freedom of expression or this open society statement that was adopted is the values of the freedom of expression, right? That the person or the citizen will have the freedom of expression he can express or he or she can express either through the online, either through the print media, either through, you know, by, uh, by audio, by writing or by any means he can, he or she can express himself or herself right or by offline mode also right so this freedom should be safeguarded across the democracies and here the politically motivated internet shutdowns are basically severely criticized during this open society statements right so this g7 countries as well as this four democracies basically all are in the consensus that this politically motivated internet shutdowns across the world is a threat to the freedom and the democracies right here uh, the G7 countries as well as the four democracies basically affirm the human rights for all, right? Both on the online as well as the offline, right? It is also as per the Universal Declaration of the Human Rights, human rights right? And as well as it is also, you know, uh, you know, as any form of the discrimination, right? With respect to the politically motivated, you know, the shutting down of the internet as well as the discrimination across the people based on this freedom of expression. Okay. Next. You have the Neftali Bennett. The Neftali Bennett have recently been sworn in as a new Prime Minister of Israel. The new Prime Minister of Israel. So here, the Neftali Bennett, who was uh, the high-tech millinery, also, also who was the former Defense Minister of Israel, recently had been chosen for the purpose of the new Prime Minister of Israel. He was recently sworn in as a new Prime Minister of Israel. He currently belongs to the right wing party that is Yamina party, right? He took the oath of the office, right? After the Israeli Prime Minister, Israeli Parliament, which is also known as Neset, recently voted, right? You know, uh, that is uh, the closely contested, you know, election between the, uh, the, the outgoing, you know, the Prime Minister, right? Netanyahu, as well as between the Neftali Bennett. So, Neftali Bennett basically won this vote by 60, you know, so he has received this support of the 60 members of the Neset, which is the Israeli parliament, and Netanyahu basically, you know, received 59, you know, votes in the, in the favor. So, that means you could understand that it was a closely contested election or closely contested, you know, the win for the Neftali Bennett, right? Here, the, what we are talking about is eight-party alliance. So, it is a rare eight-party alliance. Right, which is basically ranging from the right wing parties, that is the Jewish nationalist, right, the Yamina party to the Arab lawmakers. That means it is basically consisting of the eight parties that has recently chosen uh, the Neftali Bunnet, right, as you know, as the as the new prime minister for uh, for the alliance, right, and for the country. So here the Bennett led alliance come, you know, uh, across unnatural coalition. That is that we are talking about this eight party alliance. That unnatural coalition basically consisting of the left wing, okay, it is also having the centrist, it is also having the right wing party, right. So, you could understand that all parties, the left wing parties, centrist parties and the right wing parties are basically in the coalition, okay. And here, this, this coalition which basically now represents the Israel. And here, the Benjamin Netanyahu, right, who is who was basically holding the prime ministerial post of the Israel since the last 12 years, right? Now, uh, the, the new parliament or this Israeli parliament, Neset have chosen this Neftali Bennett for the new prime minister of the Israel, right? So, this Neftali Bennett will be the prime minister until September 2023. So, there is a deal between these eight coalition members 
that for the next two years, that means from 2021, okay, to 2023, that is the two years, for the next two years, the Neftali Bennett will be the Prime Minister. After that, this, uh, you know, uh, the, as per the as per this deal that is basically signed between these eight coalition parties, right, the Neftali Bennett will be succeeded by the Yair Lapid, right, for the next two years, for the next two years, right. So, it's a almost, you know, uh, the ended the term for the, the outgoing prime minister that is Benjamin Netanyahu who ruled the country for the 12 years in the power. Now let us understand these eight coalition parties. These eight coalition parties, right, which basically came together and it is, is basically consisting of the left party, the centrist party as well as the right wing party. So first of all, the first party is the yes at it. This is the first party of the Israel which is currently having the 17 seats, right, or which basically supported, you know, uh, you know, uh, basically supported, you know, uh, the new Prime Minister, the Neftali Bennett, with the 17 seats. So here that we are talking about the Yer Lapid, right, the Yer Lapid would be the person who belongs to this Yes at it. So here, after two years, the Yer Lapid would be the Prime Minister of Israel. The second party, in this line of the highest number of seats is basically the blue and white. This is the second coalition party. It is basically having the eight seats in the 120 Neset or the Israeli parliament. The third party is basically the, the Israel Bintenu. It is currently having the seven seat. The fourth is basically Labour. It is also having seven seat. The fifth is basically Yamina. It is basically having six seats. So you could understand that the Neftali Bennett belongs to this Yamina party, okay, which itself is only having six seats in the Neset, which is the Israeli parliament. So this Neftali Bennett belongs to this Yamina party, okay. Then six party or the six party is basically the New Hope, which is the sixth coalition party. The seventh is basically the Mirage which is having the six seats or this new hope is also having the six seats and the eighth and the last part is the united arab list it is currently having the four seats right here the most important uh, the leaders you could understand that for the yes at, for the yes at it the yar lapid is a leader for the blue and white the benny gantz is the leader for the israel bentinu right the Evgedor liverman is the leader for the labor the Mirab Micheli is the leader for the Yamina. The Neftali Bennett is the leader for the New Hope, right? You know, the Gideon Sar is the leader. For Madridge, you have the Nitjan Horovich is the leader. And for the United Arab List, the Mansur Abbas is the leader. All, all, all combinedly will be having the 61, will be having the 61 seats. So that is what we are talking about that in that in that Neset or the Israeli parliament, right, these coalition have the 61 seats, okay, and the Neftali or the Neftali Bennett have won this close contested election in this, uh, in the Israeli parliament and here he will be the new prime minister of Israel, okay. Next, the Forex Reserve, see here first time in the last 30 years, the Indian Forex Reserve have crossed 600 US billion dollars. That is the first time, right, that has been crossed. And in the last week, right, that has been ended on the June 4, right, uh, you know, the, by the rising of 6 billion dollars or 6 billion US dollars, the Indian Forest Foreign Reserve or Foreign Exchange Reserve have crossed 600 billion US dollars. Okay, currently the Forex Reserve with India is basically 605 US billion dollars, which has been reported right as you know uh, as reserve bank of india which is basically currently having this forex reserve okay and how how could the india basically achieve this 605 uh, the us billion dollars reserve it is because of the rise in foreign currency assets which is the major components in the overall reserve so let us understand the countries which is having the highest foreign exchange reserve right the highest foreign exchange reserve as on the june 13 2021 according to the international Moni international monetary fund the china is having the highest you know the foreign reserve that is around 3330 us billion dollars right 
followed by Japan that is 1378 US billion dollars of the foreign reserves followed by the Switzerland which is having 1070 US billion dollars right and then followed by the Russia that is 605.2200 US billion dollars and then the fifth country is India which is also having the 605.008 US billion dollars now let us understand what is this foreign exchange reserve the foreign exchange reserve is basically consisting of the reserve assets that is being held by the central bank so in India the central bank is a reserve bank of India right this reserve bank of India keeps this foreign exchange or the reserve assets in the form of this foreign exchange right the reserve bank of India used right uh, these foreign exchange or the forest forex reserve for the purpose of you know uh, the fulfilling the liabilities that has been used specifically also for the purpose of exchange rate as well as to set the monetary policy here the most important component of the foreign exchange reserve that we are talking about the foreign currency assets this foreign currency assets basically consisting of you know uh, the every central bank right here the reserve bank of india basically maintains the currencies like in the us dollar euro the pound sterling australian dollar and the japanese yen so these are basically you know the five currencies or five internationally recognized currencies by uh, the international monetary fund that the country should possess right these foreign currency assets in order to calculate their foreign exchange reserve the third the second is basically gold the third is basically sdr the special drawing rights that is basically with the international monetary fund so that we are talking about the inter this special drawing right this is basically a reserve currency with the imf so this special drawing rights are basically supplementary foreign exchange reserve right uh, which are defined and maintained by the international monetary fund so uh, this sdr the special drawing rights are basically units of the account for the imf right and it is not a currency it is not a currency but it represents some sort of a claim to the currency which is held by the particular imf member right you know for which it may be exchanged with respect to those currency the next is basically the reserve tranche position so that is the reserve capital with imf so what is that reserve tranche position it is simply the difference between the international monetary funds holding of the particular country's currency right with the country's imf design quota so you can say that the reserve tranche is the portion of that required quota of the currency that every member country must provide to the international monetary fund right and there from this for this reserve tranche position it can be utilized for their own purposes right okay so here you could understand that after 30 years the india's foreign foreign exchange reserve have crossed 600 us billion dollars right it was 605 us billion dollars as on the june 4 2021 <coughs> okay so here the top five countries the china followed by japan followed by switzerland followed by russia and followed by india so india is the fifth position in terms of the foreign exchange reserve okay rare earth or rare earth metals so here what we are talking is that the us senate senate is basically the upper house the upper house right of congress congress ka matlab hota hai jaise parliament right in the us the parliament is called congress congress consisting of the two house the senate is basically the upper house so the us upper house or the congress upper house basically passed a law that law is basically aiming at boosting the american production in the processing of this rare earth elements right recently right the us geological survey says that the us imports around 80% of its rare earth metals that is been consumed in the in the country from the china right so here the rare earth metal that we are talking basically consisting of the 17 chemical elements in the periodic table you might have studied this periodic table in your class 11th and the 12th right during the chemistry right so here this 17 chemical elements which are specifically called the rare earth elements which are consisting of the 15 lanthanides right the 15 lanthanides which is basically you know consisting of the 15 chemical elements plus the scandium the scandium basically having the atomic number of 21 as well as the yttrium which is also having the atomic number of 39 so here the scandium plus yttrium plus 15 lanthanide elements are basically combinedly all seven chemical elements are called the rare earth so you can understand that in lanthanides which basically start from the atomic number 57 to atomic number 71 they are all 
15 in the number they are all part of your rare earth elements rare earth elements they are starting from the lanthanum to the lutetium right so for example if i if i just pronounce you can uh, you can just remind or you memorize yourself the first is basically your you know your lanthanum that is the first that is the 57th then you have cerium that is 58th then you have the you know the parasodium that is 59 the neodymium then prometium then samarium then europium gadolium then terbium diprosium holmium erbium thulium yttrium luritium that is basically all five elements that we are talking basically with respect to the lanthanide elements so it is scandinium scandium and the yttrium are considered the rare earth elements because they tend to occur in the same ore deposits right where this lanthanides basically occurred okay and they also exhibit the similar chemical properties but definitely they are having the different electronic and the magnetic property the cerium that we are talking is the most abundant rare earth metals that are found in the earth okay why we call them rare they are not rare right or there is no shortage of these metals or this or these elements but there is extraction is very very difficult it requires very high skill and the capital intensive investment and there are a lot of environmental issues with respect to these rare art okay so there are two main ores of the extractions that has monazite and bastensite right in terms of their properties they're basically having you know uh, the colors from the shiny silver to the iron gray right so that means they have different color combinations they are generally soft malleable ductile and usually they are very very reactive and that is the reason they are having some sort of environmental issues right and they are very reactive specifically at the elevated temperature okay and uh, they have a lot of industrial application for example they can be used for the civilian applications like for the smartphones in the laptops in the petroleum refining as a catalyst right it can be used also in the military applications like the nuclear applications right and it is also very very essential to the electric vehicles that currently been you know uh, uh, newly been introduced in the market it is also used in the wind turbines and the drones right the china which is having the largest or the highest number of reserve that is around 37 percentage of the world rare earth reserve is basically found in china it is followed by the brazil and the vietnam that is around 18 percent each that is followed by the russia that is 15 percent and remaining 12 percent are basically found in the other countries in that scattered way right the zen Xiaoping, right also one said the middle east has the oil right that means the middle east basically is the highest reserve of the oil and the crude right and the china is basically the highest in terms of this rare earth elements okay this is basically periodic table that we are talking about the first we are talking about this you know uh, this uh, that is where basically we are talking about uh, the lanthanium series so here yeah, the lanthanium series you can understand is that the first is basically the lanthanum then you have the cerium then you have the parasodium then you have right the neodymium okay then you have basically the promethium okay then you have sm means smarium okay eu means you have the europium the gd means you have gadolinium okay gadolinium then tv means you have the terbium the dy means you have dysprosium okay then ho means you have holmium er means you have erbium pm means you have thulium okay yb means you have yttrium the lu means you have lutetium lutetium apart from that you have scandium that is 21 that is 21 okay and then you have basically the yttrium that is y that is 39 that is the atomic number right and uh, that we are talking about this lanthanium the lanthanium the atomic number is basically your 57 it is from 57 to completely to the 71 so this is the atomic number that we are talking this is lanthanide series plus the scandium and yttrium these are all you know rare earth okay that's all for today thank you very much we'll meet again tomorrow for our next brand of pairs thank you very much